What is up, Earthnoids and Space Noids? I am just a simple new type. And in this episode, we are returning to the 908th Mobile Reconnaissance Company and CPO Quaran during Universal Century 0079. Last time, Quaran failed at getting laid and a miner got drunk. Also, things went bad on a mission and Quaran found himself saving an EFF soldier. This time, Xeon will take on a heavy fort class ship. They will be led into a trap by a bunch of hover trucks and a member of Quaran's team will not make it out alive. So let's get into this. Before we start, the people in the comments informed me that the plane we saw hovering over the Heavy Fort class ship last time was the Dragonfly. The Dragonfly is a prop plane that was very low tech, but very helpful in areas of heavy Minoski particle density. It is hard to detect both visually and on infrared radars. Because it requires little runway to launch, it could be sortied from a big tray class. This thing is really slow and flies low to avoid being spotted. The deputy commander is talking to Sol about what he thinks is going on on the front. Sol believes that they may have a land fortress and wants to focus on scouting in areas they haven't received any intel from yet. The way the deputy commander is framing this makes him seem like he's trying to gather dirt on Cameron. Frostail is overhearing the conversation, but someone comes in to relieve her of duty for the night. She is done with her shift. As she leaves, she notices Quaran daydreaming. He was thinking about the colony drop on Australia. Frostail tells her what happened with Cameron. They wanted to send someone out to scout for him, but Cameron was ordered to shift all focus on the front. It was ultimately luck that got him rescued. He says he is grateful, but not to worry about it. He goes to talk to the chief engineer who tells him that the fixes to his Iron Mustang will be about 15 hours. He wants the chief to increase the output so he can make jumps more efficiently. He tells Quaran it will make it a little unstable. He reminds him it isn't a plane. Guile and the 908th are noticing that EFF has Type 61 tanks everywhere. Back at the base, Quaran gathers his team. They are working with some mercs and they aren't really getting along. They head out in a bunch of weasels. We talked about the weasel in our breakdown of Requiem for Vengeance, but those that didn't watch it, let's break it down. The weasel, or simply armored vehicle, is a six-wheeled, light armored vehicle that acts more as a scout unit. This unit can also turn into a boat and traverse water. It is fast, but ultimately weaker than a Magella attack tank or Magella Ains. It has a 37mm machine cannon, a machine gun, and a triple missile launcher. Loaded up on the weasel, everyone feels nervous. The mercs tease Quaran that the weasel isn't as smooth as the Wapa. In reality, Xeon men are dying and people are grouping up to better survive. They may not want to be with one another, but Quaran ensures them that they are going to complete their mission in one piece. It puts his mind at ease. Suddenly, you hear coming from the front. The driver yells out and apologizes to everyone for being stuffed into a coffin to die. Talk about an icebreaker. The soldier manning the turret notices something at his two o'clock, but he isn't fast enough and he is gunned down. Quran gets out on the turret and notices EFF units. The weasel spreads out. One EFF soldier fires a bazooka of some sorts. It's kind of smaller than the Regina. It takes out one of the weasels. They all get out of the vehicles and take cover. They notice an EFF scouting team, which means more forces are not too far behind. Out of nowhere, it begins raining. He looks up at the rain to see a land fortress. It is the Heavy Fort class ship. He is in shock as his men await orders. He tells his men to retreat back to the weasels right as the Heavy Fort begins firing its twin cannons on the scouts. Quaran drags his comrade who has been shot back to the weasel. Another soldier is shot in the head right in front of him. They get into the weasel and head into the water. EFF loses track of them and they send out a mongoose to find them. Luckily, they are able to blend in with their environments quite well. We get a moment where Jorg and another soldier named Hans help each other and they become best buds. The rain has cleared up, but Minofsky particle density is quite high, so they can't get a message back to base. At the base, Frostel is on duty once again. Cameron says she looks tired and suggests she use her time to sleep, but Cameron also looks like she hasn't slept either. Jorg wants to head out on his own to the top of the hill to try to establish a connection with base using an antenna. Quaran wants to go with him, but Jorg says he has to watch over his men. Hans decides to go with him. He has been shot, so another soldier tries to help him. As they head out, Hans asks Jorg how a merc came to help the recon team. He is silent. They ask him where he comes from, and he says, Side 2. Side 2, specifically the capital, Island Ifish, was the colony that was used during Operation British. Oh no, Operation British is Jorg's Vietnam. Back at the base, another soldier asks about Jorg. What's his deal? Why can't I get a read on this guy? 
You never read that guy. Koran tells him that Jorg was really into the cause of Xeon independence. But once he saw his home come crashing down to Earth, he felt broken and lost interest in helping space knowing independence. He is now just here for the ride. Cameron suggests that his problem was finding some sense of justice in this to begin with. For Quran, this has always been a job that he carries out. Remember, all he wants to do is get back to side three. They get near the top and try to get a signal. No luck, unfortunately. Jorg heads up higher to the peak. Han says he can't make sense of him. See, even Hans can't get a read on this guy. I can never read that guy. Hans is yelling at him when suddenly they get a signal. Back at base, they are able to pinpoint their location. However, they notice something from above, and seconds later, the peak of the mountain is destroyed. It was taken out by the mongoose. Jorg is dead. Back at the base, the sixth battle group is heading out and preparing for an all-out assault. They are even whipping out the Dabde class ship for this one. Quran shows Gael Jorg's scarf. It seems that right before the mongoose attacked, Jorg pushed Hans out of the way and saved his life. Quran and Gael begin fighting with one another. Cameron and Frostel let the two fight it out. Sol eventually comes over and stops him. Meanwhile, the 6th Battalion is on the front and are able to push EFF forces back. The Dobde commander wonders why the Heavy 4 class ship isn't showing up on the front. The chief was able to increase the output of the WAPA by 20%. Quran says it really is an unbroken horse now. His team is ready to sortie. He goes to talk to his men and he sees Jorg. He is starting to see things. Their mission is to cut off a supply convoy at the flanks of the enemy forces. The 6th Battalion will handle the Big Fort class. He tells his men that he wants to end this so they could go back home. They all move out. The Big Trey class keeps pushing forward. Quaran's men have almost reached his location. He notices that steering is a little harder with increased output. Once they reach their location, they begin scouting and notice that it isn't a supply convoy. The Big Trey class struggles over the hills so they send out the Black Hound team, which is a team of hover trucks. Quran tries to call this into headquarters. The Big Trade class is at a disadvantage here, and the Dabde commander thinks they have it on the run, but they aren't ready for an incoming attack from the hover trucks. The Zakus guarding the Dabde begin attacking using their machine guns. They hit one truck, and it goes up in flames. Xeon realizes they have landmines. This is specifically the heavy mine used by the RTX 440 ground assault type gun tank, which was also used to kamikaze a Dabde in the gravity front. Quaran and his team are the only ones who realize that the Dabde has fallen into a trap. Quran and his men go out to assist the Dabde. We have a moment where one of the Dabde Zakus just looks at a mind right before it explodes right in his face. Gold. As Quran goes in, the Dabde gets bombarded. While the hover trucks distracted them, the Big Trey took a name from kilometers away. After firing at nothing, they decide to retreat, but the Big Trey sends out another volley. The Dabde in the 6th Battalion is destroyed. Quran and his team retreats. This caused the Zeonic Front to be pushed back. After the event, things went back to normal, but they were eventually visited by the members of the Court of Inquiry in regards to the incident with the Dabde. They are investigating Cameron. They take a recess when Quran comes along. It appears that the deputy commander is trying to blame this all on Cameron. Quran and Cameron's sister Meryl listens through the walls as their investigation continues. The deputy commander tells the higher-ups that Cameron ignored direct orders during this operation. It is clear that this investigation is all for show and they are looking to pin the blame on Cameron. She begins yelling at her higher-ups, stating that she would never allow for one of her men to be left behind. They decide that she must return to her homeland. I don't think this is a direct discharge, but I'm not completely sure what the language used here. Time goes by, but the 908th continues on. Suddenly, everyone rushes to watch something being broadcast to the entire Earth's sphere. Quran goes to see Giran Zabi, mourning the death of Garma, trying to raise the morale of the people of Zeon. And that will do it for this episode. Quran is starting to see the struggles of being on the front lines of war. It simply seems like an endless nightmare that never seems to end. More people die around them while the two sides push forward and backwards a few inches. We are also seeing a man try his best to simply mind his own business, but he is constantly pulled into the political drama that is the military. Also, chapter 8 of this manga is titled Mein Kampf, which means my struggle, which is fitting for the chapter where everyone is dying around Quran, but uh... What? Japanese people are notorious for trying to be genuine while coming off accidentally racist. In our next episode, we will conclude our adventures with Quran and Iron Mustang. Cameron may be leaving, but before she leaves, she gives the 908th intel on the Federation's mobile suit, the Gundam. Quran's team will prepare to take it out. But that will do it for now, new types. Remember, keeping your head down never works. Someone is always going to try to bring their nonsense into your life. Peace.